G'day Dave here, and we're looking at Titus chapter 2 and verses 9 and 10. Let me read them for you. They're quite confronting. It says, Slaves are to submit to their masters in everything, and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness, so that they may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. What do we do with that? It's challenging stuff, isn't it? It just doesn't seem to fit our modern sensitivities. Surely slavery is something that's been outlawed, done away with. Everybody on the planet realizes that it's wrong. So how can we be promoting slavery? And is this verse promoting it? What do we do with it today? Well, as you look back over the recent centuries, you'll know that there has been some horrific stories of slavery. Uh, generation after generation of people who were stolen from Africa to be laborers, literally in America and England and so on, whole economies based upon slavery. And that's perhaps not the same today, but there's, I understand, slavery continues. Uh, you get child labor where people are being paid less than a subsistence wage, where uh, you get sex trafficking with young girls being stolen and, and put into uh, houses as prostitutes and enslaved to drugs and prostitution. You get all kinds of horrific stories. And we know deep down that slavery is so wrong. And of course, Christians have been at the forefront of opposing slavery. You go back and look at William Wilberforce, John Newton, who stood up in Parliament with Wilberforce, saying that slavery was wrong, that the British government needed to outlaw it. We need to stop bringing people in boats across uh, to England. And you get in more recent times, perhaps people like Martin Luther King, uh, or Nelson Mandela. There's a problem here. And so when we turn to a part of the Bible that says, slaves, you must submit to your masters, it just kind of grates. It seems like it's something that it belongs in an era past and we've moved on from that. And surely here's one area where at least the Apostle Paul got it wrong, if not the Bible, if not God. But we need to be careful. We need to be very careful with saying God gets something wrong. It's probably more likely that we're wrong in our understanding. What do we do with it and how do we understand it? Well, one of the things is we need to understand the nature of slavery then if we're going to be able to see why there is an encouragement to slaves to behave this way. And slavery in the ancient world was different to slavery in the modern world. Now, one of the reasons was that slavery was a very common thing. And we didn't have, uh, back in the ancient world, the bankruptcy provisions when people go into debt that we have now. They would uh, often be unable to return a debt, unable to pay what they owe. And so they would voluntarily put themselves into slavery until they paid off that debt. And that was a major reason in the ancient world for slavery. Now, there was probably people stealing and kidnapping and slaves as well. And there was certainly slaves who had been brought into captivity because of warfare and being overthrown. But simple debt was a major reason. There was an economic aspect to this. And if you go back into the Old Testament, you recognize that there was a year of Jubilee, the 50th year, when slaves had all of their debts cancelled and they were to return to freedom. Now, that's the first thing, reasons for slavery. The, the second thing that I'd point out is um, first century historians have indicated that there were times when in Rome itself there were up to one third of the population who were slaves. That means if you're going to speak to the population group as a whole and ignore slaves, then you're wiping out 33% of the population. And we have a number of parts of scripture that address different household groups. Uh, it speaks here in this passage to older men, older women, uh, older women teaching younger women. It speaks to younger men and so on. And to speak to slaves, it's one way of, of gathering in the household group, those who were working in that way within the family. We also recognize uh, that people could be in a whole range of different positions in society while still being enslaved. You might be a manual laborer, you could be an apprentice, you might be a white collar worker. There's even accounts of politicians who were slaves. It's not what we would immediately think of, is it? Fourth thing that I'd want to say is that the Bible is actually very condemning of slave trading. 
uh, it's condemning of people stealing. Now, there are different words that are used for slave and for slavery. There is the word doulos, uh, the general word for slave, and Jesus describes himself as a slave, becoming a slave to serve people. Paul describes himself as a doulos, a slave of God, and serving the people with the gospel. Um, There is another word that gets used of those who have been stolen, kidnapped, entrapped in slavery. And that's condemned. You can read about that in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Uh, Fifthly, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul writes, If people get an opportunity to be freed from slavery, they might as well take it. It's a good thing to be set free. If your debt is cancelled or if you are able by some other means to no longer be a slave, we'll grab it with both hands. It's a good thing. Sixthly, Paul illustrates his commitment to free slaves when in the letter to Philemon, which is the next book of the Bible, he writes to Philemon about Philemon's slave Onesimus, who Philemon has presumably given to Paul, uh, at least to help him, to support him in his needs. And Paul is now looking to send him back and he's encouraging uh, Philemon to accept Onesimus back, but not as a slave, as a freed man. And Paul goes so far as to say, if he still owes you any debt, I'll fix you up for that. But wouldn't it be great that you might be united with your slave as brother to brother, no longer slave and master, but free uh, and and enjoying each other's company in in a whole new way. So there are six points there, the reasons for slavery, the massive uh, widespread engagement in slavery, parts of householders. Uh, The Bible is against slave trading, people stealing. It's uh, approving of people getting their freedom. In fact, you have the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament system. And Paul himself illustrates that he's even willing to buy someone to give them their freedom. Now, what do we do then with this? Well, Let's read it again, verse 9. Slaves are to submit to their masters in everything and to be well-pleasing, not talking back or stealing, but demonstrating utter faithfulness. Now, when you read those attributes, I think what we're reading is the opposite of what you might expect. So that instead of doing every can, everything you can to usurp your master, uh, to do things behind his back, to get away with whatever you can... Be submissive towards him. Instead of actually grudgingly just doing the bare minimum, do what's going to be well-pleasing to him. Instead of talking behind his back, uh, don't talk back. Or instead of taking things and getting extra for yourself and nicking stuff when you're not being noticed, don't steal. No, demonstrate that you are utterly faithful, that you are a reliable, trustworthy person. And as you do that, notice the next phrase, so that you may adorn the teaching of God our Saviour in everything. See, throughout this passage, Paul is concerned about the reputation of the Christian message. He's concerned about the reputation of Jesus and his gospel. And if a slave was to be undermining his master, stealing from the master, slandering the master and plotting to escape from the master then when the master looks at the slave who claims to be Christian, he says there's nothing in it, doesn't make a scrap of difference to their life. Why would I take that seriously? But if counterculturally, by the Spirit of God, the slave is liberated, knowing that he's a freed man in Christ, to be able to serve willingly his master and to be able to demonstrate with his life that he's taking his relationship with God seriously, then that'll make a difference. Friends, we need to realize that our actions have a powerful thing to say for good or for bad. Let me give you an illustration of when I was confronted by this. I, it was after a church camp on a weekend and I was exhausted and we'd been caught in traffic for hours and we finally got home and I went and I ordered a pizza And I got to the place to pick up the pizza and they hadn't made it yet. And we'd 
put in the order and they'd messed it all up. And then when they finally made the pizza, it was wrong. And I gave the person behind the counter both barrels. I went home and I started to feel guilty. And I wondered this, what would happen if the person behind the counter at the pizza shop turned up at church the next weekend and saw that it was me who was speaking? Would they take Christianity seriously? Not a chance. So I got in the car and I went back and I apologised to the person that I'd been rude to. Friends, we need our lives to back up our words. And our words need to point to the wondrous grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll hear more about that next time.